the main black bear, a symbol of the wild, an icon of our state. The expansive forest of northern, eastern, and western Maine supports the largest black bear population in the eastern United States. Estimates put the bear population at between 25,000 and 30,000, yet people rarely see them because they often inhabit dense forests. Since 1975, the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife has been monitoring Maine's bear population in three different areas to ensure that our management decisions are based on current and sound scientific information. Because of their elusiveness, bears have become a symbol of the wild and an icon of our state. Once considered a nuisance with a bounty, bears are now valued by hunters, outdoor recreationalists, and the general public. However, without the annual harvest, the bear population would be unmanageable and bears would be forced to forage for food where humans exist. In some states that do not allow hunting, bears will satisfy their hunger in bird feeders, garbage cans, pet food left outside. They will even enter a dwelling and help themselves to the refrigerator. An important piece of bear management is hunting. Since 2005, hunters have harvested approximately 3,000 bears each year, and most of these are taken over bait. More bears were harvested in Aroostook County than any other county. Fewer bears were harvested in central and coastal Maine, where bear populations are low and hunting opportunity is limited. Wildlife management in general is a really important part of Maine culture and uh, especially considering how much we uh, utilize our natural resources. Hunting is a, is a huge industry, it's a huge impact on the economy, so we can't really manage hunting without understanding wildlife. Randy talks about how it, uh, we study recruitment while well, we're studying how many bears come into the population and hunting is how many bears Take, are taken out of the population. So you really need to balance the give and take and um, that can't happen without what we're doing right now. Managing Maine's 30,000 black bear is handled by a very small dedicated crew made up of two department biologists, a few contract workers, and young volunteers. Most of our crew is made up of uh, recent college graduates or people who are still in college. It usually starts out for almost everybody who starts working for me, starts out in a volunteer position. And that's sort of a testing ground for us. And the best of the volunteers are, are able to compete for a contract down the road. And some of those volunteers that first volunteered that became a contractor, some of those have stayed with me for quite a number of years. Each June, Randy Cross and his crew take to the woods in one of three management areas. The study has been going on for 30 years, and Randy has been at it for 25 of those 30 years. They sleep and eat in cabins in the study area and review their plans after the evening meal. This is hard work, taking up every waking hour, five days a week for six to seven weeks. The crew is up at sunrise and after a hearty breakfast set out to check the day's traps. The crew will split up with some setting traps and the others checking trap lines in hopes of trapping two to three bear each day. It's our, um, our finger on the pulse of the bear population is to keep in touch with these females. It's, a, it's basically a, 
long-term monitoring project for recruitment is what it is. As the crews head out, they communicate with two-way radios and update each other on progress. Yeah, I got you, just barely. What's going on, anything new? The radios also provide a safety net in the event someone on an ATV gets a flat or has an accident far from any other human contact. The traps used are really snares that do not harm the bear. So that's how it's set up like that. So when the bear steps in it, he pushes down this trigger and we'll make a false platform with these twigs. When the bear steps in it, watch your camera back up just a little. When he steps in it like this, it pulls it up against his leg, and pulls it onto his wrist. And now he's attached to the tree here when he pulls out the whole, the whole rigging. Because federally controlled drugs are used to tranquilize the bears, the crew must record each dose and prepare them carefully. The amount of drug used depends on the estimated size of the bear. A homemade jab stick fitted with a syringe is assembled and readied. Bait and scents are used to attract the hungry critters to the traps. Sometimes bears are caught for the first time, but many are caught several times. The crews know immediately whether they know a bear by the distinctive colored discs in the bear's ears or of a female sporting a radio collar. The discs in the ears are numbered, identifying them in the study. But oftentimes, Randy recognizes a bear and gives it a name like Beauty, Sal, Diesel, Earthquake, and Rock. After 15 or 20 minutes, fighting off the ever-present no see and black flies, the crew returns to the now sleeping bear. They work quickly and efficiently before the drug wears off. Measurements are taken, the bears are weighed, Randy performs a complete examination of the bear from head to foot, looking for scars, abrasions, skin color. The crew does their part and records everything for analysis later. The crew records all kinds of information, weight, length, physical condition, temperature, scars, missing ears, the exact time a bear is tranquilized, and the dosage. Because males often damage their ears while fighting, our biologists tattoo their inner lip for a permanent mark. VHF radio collars have been used for over 30 years to track bears and to locate their dens. Since 2008, the department began replacing the radio collars with GPS collars that provide more information on bear movement, home range, and density estimates. Other things in the medicine kit include drugs to reverse an effect, eye lubricant, drugs to regulate breathing and heart rate. The crew will also bring in pliers for extracting teeth, a scale and rigging used to weigh each bear, a tape measure, and other basic tools that might be needed. Everything is old, worn, and literally held together with duct tape. The program runs on a bare bones budget. Main Warden Service aircraft, equipped with radio signal direction equipment, fly over vast regions of the study areas searching for the faint beep, beep, beep of the caller. When they pick up a signal, they begin circling until they find the exact location of the den and record it with onboard GPS devices. The coordinates are then used by the biologist to plot the den locations on a map. They will then organize and plan their den visits.
Sometime around the 1st of February, mature females will give birth to cubs in their winter dens. With radio collars applied during the summer trapping season, it is possible to locate these dens in the remote wilderness, far from passable roads and any signs of civilization. February is always cold, and in recent years, the snowfall has been heavy, more than four feet deep in many locations. Working conditions are made more difficult when the wind is howling, the snow is blowing, or there's freezing rain. One crew member is tasked with digging out the opening to the den. Most of the time, the actual opening is several feet below the snow level, so working on one's belly and upside down is just the way it is. Kid, the smallest crew member, a petite young woman who has become an expert on both the summer trapping crew and the den visits, gets the enviable job of entering the den. But only once the mother, who is in a sleepy hibernating state, is really asleep with the effect of the drug. Many bears are tagged as newborns during the winter den visits, while others trapped for the first time are tagged, measured, and weighed for the study. The tags and data collected help the biologists understand home range, density estimates, and the general health and condition of the bear population. This can be dangerous work. Sometimes the drug hasn't had its full effect. <laughs> The work of our bear biologist is supported by federal excise taxes on arms, handguns, ammunition, and archery equipment, hunting and trapping license revenues, and a grant from Safari Club International and GMO. In 2007, the Maine State Legislature created the Black Bear Research Fund, which provides a dedicated funding source for black bear research. This fund requires trappers and non-resident deer hunters to purchase a bear permit. Approximately $90,000 in new permit fees was generated during the 2008 and 2009 bear seasons. This fund also provides a mechanism for receiving private donations that support our black bear programs. Over the years, Randy has worked hard to get the word out to influential members of the public about the importance of this work legislators, government officials, members of the media, and key people from industry, education, and society have been fortunate to witness this work. But bears are so elusive that few people ever see one. To learn more about the Maine Black Bear Project, visit our website at mefishwildlife.com. Select wildlife, then species information, and then Black Bear. You can also contact the Bangor Research Office at 207-941-4466, located at 650 State Street, Bangor, Maine. You may also be interested in becoming a member of the Maine Black Bear Stewardship Committee, a 5013C nonprofit organization that supports this important work. Founded by Melissa Mycott in 2009, the corporation's registered office is located at 40 Libby Pines Road, Standish, Maine. I feel extremely privileged to have had the opportunity to view and observe these magnificent animals, and I hope that others have the opportunity well into the future. Without Maine's dedicated staff and scores of volunteers, Maine's black bear population would not be as secure as it is today.